Hi, everyone, and welcome to our uh, weekly AI seminar. Um, it's my pleasure today to have Jay Pajar presenting on a tale of three knowledge graphs. Uh, Jay is a research uh, assistant professor of computer science at USC and the director of the Center on Knowledge Graph and a research lead at ISI. Uh, his principal areas of research are artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science. Uh, he completed a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz, earned his PhD at the University of Maryland College Park, and received his MS and BS uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Jay has also worked in industry at Yahoo, Google, LinkedIn, and Oracle. He is the author of uh, over 50 peer-reviewed publications and has received four Best Paper Awards for his work. And his work has been featured in AI uh, magazine. And today, he'll be talking about a tale of three knowledge graphs. And before I turn it over to Jay, uh, just a couple of things. If you're a panelist and you have questions, uh, raise your hand or use the chat. If you're an attendee, please use the Q&A uh, feature. And Jay, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks for that introduction. Um, can everyone see the slides? Yes. yes. Yeah, great. So uh, as Deborah mentioned, my talk today is the tale of three knowledge graphs. Um, so imagine you're asked to review this paper. Uh, and I imagine many of you as academics often have this problem where you're either serving as a reviewer for a conference or a journal, um, or your advisor says, hey, I need some help with this paper. Uh, can you review it? So what does it take to review a paper? What do you do? Um, if you reflect and you think about what is what goes into that process of reviewing a paper? What questions do you ask? Uh, what scrutiny do you apply to that paper? Uh, and so, you know, I think in a, a more interactive talk, uh, I, I would love to hear uh, the audience response, but I'm gonna kind of pretend you're yelling things out and, uh, uh, and just go through uh, some of the things you might ask. Uh, so, you know, one question is, what is the research question that this paper addresses? You know, what is the problem they're trying to solve or what is the question they're trying to study? Uh, the second question you might ask is how do they study it? What methods do they use? Um, and how well are those methods supported to actually be the right way to study this question? So you want to understand, is this the right method to answer the question? Once you know what methods they're using, you might want to compare it to prior work. How has this been done in the past? What methods have been used in the past to study the same research question. And once you understand how it's done in the past, you might also ask more about the specific data that they use. So um, in you know, computer science papers, you might be interested in, are they using the benchmark data sets that are most commonly used to study this task? For problems that are more socio-behavioral sciences, often data is collected. So there's sort of an experimental design, there's a subject population, there's sampling of some sort, uh, there are control conditions and experimental conditions, uh, and there are, are then you know, data collection instruments. So all of those are important considerations uh, when you're trying to understand this. Once you look at the data uh, and you know the methods, the question is, are the results that the methods provide uh, significant? Do they actually provide support for whatever hypothesis or observational question uh, that initially spurred this paper? And beyond this, you might want to understand what the overall scientific community thinks about this subject. Is there broad consensus? Is there a lot of um, a lot of diversity in the views about this topic? Are the researchers who are conducting this research well respected based on their prior work? Do they collaborate with others in the community, and are they look are they part of a very tight knit group, or are they part of a very diverse group of researchers? So all of these questions are questions that you might have to tackle as you're trying to answer you know, this question of, is this a good paper? And those are really complex decisions. You know, deciding whether this paper should be accepted or published requires lots and lots of knowledge. And so today I'm going to talk about these sorts of problems, problems that require lots and lots of knowledge to make complex decisions. Uh, and I'm going to motivate this through um, you know, three knowledge graphs. The first is going to tackle scientific reproducibility, which is uh, motivated by that first setting. I'll talk about competition in business uh, and about how a struggling entrepreneur can use knowledge to uh, 
you know, get a leg up on the competition when creating a business. And the last knowledge graph uh, will be common sense. So the sorts of ideas you and I may take for granted, but AI models are still trying to um, wrap their heads around. And supporting all of these three knowledge graphs are a common set of ingredients or tools that we've constructed um, in the, the Center on Knowledge Graphs. And so, uh, uh, sorry. Jay, we're yeah. getting a lot of like gray uh, rectangles on your screen. Uh, okay, let me try sharing again. Uh, yeah, I, I also I saw somebody ask if the slides are. I think it's the Q&A and so on box when you put it over your presentation. Oh, okay. Let me just close the Q&A box and close. Uh, is that better? Uh, so the, yeah, you just need to keep that box, like the right box, which I think is your uh, video, like further up. The right should be okay if you don't have things at the top. Yeah, let me see if I can just get rid of that box now. <laughs> I can't. Uh, yeah, that's as far as I can get it off the screen. Uh, I haven't had this problem before, sorry. It should work. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, is this better? This is perfect. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so uh, as I was saying, uh, as part of this, um, you know, of these three knowledge graphs, we built a common set of tools that pervade, um, you know, the center on knowledge graphs. and. Those tools help us build these knowledge graphs easily and quickly, uh, and I'd like to motivate why they're so important to, to allow us to do these sorts of tasks. So knowledge graph number one, uh, scientific reproducibility. So as I described, one of the hardest questions we can ask is, you know, is this good science? Because it involves so much uh, domain knowledge as well as understanding a broader context. And so we have a project called Macroscore, and that's a Macroscore is the system for assessing the scientific reproducibility of uh, research. So we start out with papers and the claims they make. Uh, so what, what is it that the paper is trying to show? What is the argument that it's, it's making? And we first look at things at the micro level. We try to look at all the details about the study, uh, the sample size, the sample population, uh, the different trials that may be undertaken, the models used, the p-values of those models, uh, the effect sizes, et cetera. In addition to looking at all of the details of the paper, we're also going to look at things at the macro level. Uh, we're going to look at the entire bibliometric network. So papers that cite the paper, papers um, cited by the paper, uh, the author's collaborations, the social networks that they're part of. Uh, and so we're going to look at that level of the scientific community and how it supports the work they're doing. And then we're going to take all of these and put them in a knowledge graph. Uh, and this knowledge graph is going to power a number of downstream uh, applications. So one is representation learning. We're going to use representation learning algorithms, which are deep learning approaches that try to use the structure of the knowledge graph to better understand the content and context of the scientific papers. We're going to use those representation learning outputs to come up with a set of probabilistic confidence scores from different types of uh, models. Some models that are more focused on the micro level features, some that are more focused on macro level features, and some that put everything together uh, and create a, a holistic approach to creating that probabilistic confidence score. And then finally, we're going to provide interpretations and explanations. We're going to take all of the scores and put them in language that a domain expert can easily understand. So that's sort of the, the framework of macro score. I'm going to very briefly talk about the micro and macro level approaches. So at the micro level, as I said, we'd like to take um, you know, a passage in a paper and extract from it important pieces of information like the effect size, the name of the model used, and the p-values. And this is work um, that Shang Ren and uh, Dang Ho Li, who's now a PhD student in my group, have uh, really taken on. And their approach uses the sampling and occlusion algorithm to use some labeled data and find 
phrases that are indicative of a particular type of feature. So here you can see the sentence result of a logistic regression analysis show that retention is not predicted by initial attitudes. And logistic regression analysis is the name of a model. And you might you know, hypothesize that when you see results of a blank show, uh, that blank is going to be a model name. So what we're trying to find are those phrases in red, which are triggers um, that allow us to identify novel instances of model names. And so this means that even if we've never seen someone use this model before, they use a, a language, uh, if they use language that's sort of similar to language in other papers, we'll be able to identify these uh, language, uh, these uh, model names. And the same for other types of uh, features like sample population. So digging in a little bit deeper, the goal is actually to take something that a user supplies us, like a label for um, a, a particular token, and look at all of the sensitivity um, of that label in kind of a, a semantic parse of the sentence, and then identify these trigger phrases. And together, we can take the user labels and the trigger phrases to identify new instances of, for example, uh, people. And I'll show at the end of the talk uh, a place where, uh, or a tool that's been developed using this approach to label data for knowledge graph. The second aspect is the macro level network features. Uh, and this is work that Fred, uh, Fred Morsetter and Christina Lerman have been working on along with their students. And the key idea is that we're going to look at Microsoft Academic Graph, which has a very pervasive uh, collection of papers, citations, authors, et cetera. And for each paper we're considering, we're going to look at the papers that reference it, as well as the papers that it cites. And so we're going to look at these two networks. We're going to try and determine uh, whether these two networks allow us to understand the difference between a highly reproducible paper and um, a not so reproducible paper. And some features are not actually very significant. So you can see the number of citations um, seem fairly to overlap between uh, low score and high score papers. But for uh, some of these other features where you look at uh, the authority score of the last author or the pub score of the last author or even the number of collaborators, we can start to see differences between uh, the types of scientific networks that lead to um, you know, higher reproducibility versus lower reproducibility. Um, while none of these features on their own can perfectly determine whether the paper will be reproducible or not, they do provide us some signal. And beyond this, um, you know, there have been a number of representation learning algorithms that use the, the network structure in order to create um, abstract reduced dimensional representations that can then be used to make the similar classifications about reproducibility. Please. Jay, can I ask a question? How do you know if a paper is reproducible? reproducible? That's a great question. So how do you know if it's reproducible it's or not? Uh, so there are a number of projects that have been trying to do this, where they try to independently reproduce papers and label them. So that's actually a set of a, a few hundred papers. And then we're part of this uh, DARPA program called SCORE, where thousands of papers are labeled by human experts, as well as um, you know hundreds of them are subject to independent replication studies. So what we're trying to do is replicate the expert's opinion of how reproducible this paper is, and the experts are being judged based on how much they, uh, how well they can reproduce um, the actual replicability result that, that comes from an independent replication. And so there's sort of this chain of, can experts predict the replication results and can AIs predict what the experts think? Uh, and so that's sort of how um, we're proceeding in this. Right. So we have thousands of papers that have been labeled um, with, you know, high reproducible or low reproducible or sort of in the middle results, along with actually explanations. All right, thank you. Cool. Um, so if everything cooperates, we'll see a, a nice demo of a, a knowledge graph browser uh, that we've created with all of the knowledge in our knowledge graph. So we can look up a paper uh, that we've, uh, you know, modeled using the Wikidata ontology. Uh, so you can see it's a scholarly article. And for the paper, we look at each section and we have it broken down to methods, discussion, et cetera, um, based on a labeling system. Within each section, we look for psycholinguistic indicators that might suggest uh, places where 
uh, the authors may be hedging or may be very confident or different types of psycholinguistic features. So here you can see there's sort of a psycholinguistic uh, weight and value for a set of uh, features. And then we see the words in that uh, section that suggest those features. We can also look at extractions within uh, particular sections of the paper. So this paper has a number of studies and for each study we associate it with a set of sample sizes. It also uses a number of different models to analyze the data, and we can see those models. Uh, we can see the three different types of models are in this paper, and we can look at um, you know, the p-values claimed. We can also go um, into scores for different types of models. So the simplest score might just use the claims that the author makes, but a more sophisticated score might use a probabilistic model that um, combines information from all of the different features that we have. And so for each of those models, we have a score. We also create a set of explanations. Um, and so this explanation will give a set of reasons, both good and bad, uh, that we gave this paper the score that it got. And so these reasons can help somebody understand uh, not just what the features are, but which features are most important. Finally, we have a lot of other features, such as where the paper is published, the paper's abstract, keywords, the author's addresses, um, the publisher name, and the claims that the paper makes. Uh, we also have a list of citations uh, so that we can understand the context and the other related work. And so that's a little preview of the, the knowledge graph that we've developed for Macroscore. Uh, using that knowledge graph, we can provide um, rich explanations. And so this is our explanation dashboard that we've developed as part of the project. And it has four different classes of features, validity of inference, reporting and transparency, design quality, scientific network, and a meta feature, which tells how confident we are in our predictions. So for each of these features, we have a little dial, which says exactly how uh, reproducible the paper is based on that, uh, that particular set of features. And then we can look at um, how much each of those different features contributes to our overall score. Uh, when you look at those features, you'll see that there are a list of pros and cons uh, for each of them. So favorable and unfavorable reasons uh, in the validity of inference, reporting and transparency. And these include things like the complexity of the design, the sample size, the self-citation count, uh, and you know, echo chamber style collaboration. So this is sort of a, a sneak peek at how we show uh, what our model has learned. So on to the next of our three knowledge graphs. Uh, this knowledge graph is about competition in business. And so uh, in this knowledge graph, um, to develop it, I've worked with people at the USC Marshall School of Business, the Tuck School of Business, uh, and the Maryland Smith School of Business, as well as uh, people at ISI. And so the goal of this project is to capture um, the, the way competition works across businesses. So one astounding fact is that most new businesses fail. Um, in the first five years, more than half of uh, new businesses fail. And after their initial year of creating jobs, every year afterwards, um, the new businesses are net job losers. So in aggregate, they're losing nearly a, a million jobs in their first decade of existence uh, past the ones that they create. And so it's a very hard landscape to start a new business and have it uh, succeed. And these business failures have been shown to disproportionately harm underrepresented minorities. So what we'd really like to do is improve the access to business knowledge so that the entrepreneurs have the knowledge they need for their businesses to succeed. So there's a lot of different sources of financial data that could be helpful in this, uh, for this problem. There are regulatory filings that capture what uh, public firms are doing. There are patents that represent the in inventions and innovations that companies are making. There are economic indicators uh, sort of at an aggregate level of different, uh, different classes of imports, exports, uh, economic activity. There's market data from stock markets uh, and exchanges, and there are web pages uh, where firms talk about what uh, products they sell and what their business services are. 
So we wanted to put all of this together in a knowledge graph we call the Business Open Knowledge Network. So we take data from web pages, patents, spreadsheets, social media, and regulatory filings, and we put it all together uh, in and run it through a set of knowledge services, which extract information, map to a domain ontology, resolve entities, and uh, use representation learning to generate high dimensional vector embeddings. And so the output is this knowledge graph that captures the relationships between companies. Uh, sometimes companies compete with each other. In other cases, they may be suppliers. For example, Warner Music uh, might supply both Pandora and Apple and Spotify with music. Uh, and competition can occur in different regions. So Dell and Apple might compute, compete in um, personal computers while Amazon, uh, uh, Apple and Samsung might compete on mobile devices. So this is what we're trying to extract from all of these different sources of data. We can publish this uh, using RDF and JSON-LD, which are standards in the knowledge graph community, but we can also use this to support a list of analytic outputs, such as analyzing business plans, helping companies discover new customers, identify places uh, where innovation has occurred and patents could be filed and suggest new supply chain partnerships. We've done all of these things uh, as part of this project. Uh, again, to show, you what, uh, to show you the power of this approach, the prior work here, TNIC, used the cleanest data you could find. It looked at regulatory filings at the SEC. And using these regulatory filings, um, there was sort of a manual extraction process to find the section where businesses describe what they did. So um, the gold standard for this type of prediction in uh, the business world is trying to determine uh, how well a company's peers uh, predict its profit. And so this has a lot of economic underpinnings. So this is sort of the R square value of this profit prediction problem using uh, the, the old TNIC model, which was trained on SEC filings uh, at a token level. Um, the other rates here, so there's the monopoly rate. And ideally, we don't want too many monopolies because what it means for a company to be a monopoly is that it has no competitors. And if we uh, find too many companies with no competitors, that might be a sign that something is going wrong. We have some ground truth data from firms like um, Capital IQ or Orbis that specifically identify um, competitor pairs as part of uh, their the product offerings. And then we have these uh, NAICS codes, which are generated by the government and capture up to six digits, which are kind of business codes of what companies do. And so using the previous sort of approaches in the business community, you can see that this R squared is around 0.37 and the NAICS codes uh, at the two digit level. So these are hierarchical codes. So the more digits you add, the more specific they are. So the two digit is a sort of general level, whereas the six digit is a very specific level. So you can see that the accuracy was about 66%. So as I said, this is using the cleanest data you could find. Now, if you go to really noisy data, if you take the web pages of companies and you kind of try to filter them as much as you can to find useful web pages, and then you throw them through a language model like Doctivec or Roberta, you can see that we are able to do a better job at predicting profits with a lower monopoly rate um, using uh, the, the noisy web data. And similarly, we can do a better job of predicting the, the NAICS codes uh, using this really noisy data. Uh, this is only for the public firms, so the same firms that are covered by the SEC. Uh, and those are the firms that have the most data. But we actually have roughly a million companies uh, for which we have web pages. So we can throw in all of these companies that are not uh, publicly traded on the stock market, but still exist uh, you know, out on the web. And we, can sh and we find that even using this really, really noisy data with companies that are um, you know, really small sometimes, we can do really well at profit prediction and remain competitive with predicting the, the NAICS code, the industry class. And so to show you what this looks like, uh, this is um, work that you know, Jerry Chu, our research programmer, has put together, uh, we can scroll down and see for a company, uh, this is Chevron, a set of competitors like Shell, United Petroleum. You can see, you know, the categories, the NAICS code, the official names, the official addresses, et cetera. And then we can click on a competitor and see the same information. So we see that it's 
compete with Chevron and ConocoPhillips and Exxon. Uh, and again, it, we have sort of information about this ticker symbol as well as the um, the different uh, different metadata that we have. And this is only the beginning. We're, we're trying to grow this to add, um, you know, patents that Chevron or Shell may have, uh, as well as information about their social media activity uh, and potential imports and exports that uh, come from Customs and Border Protection uh, to and from Chevron. So what can we do with this um, business knowledge graph? So we put together this entrepreneurship portal where somebody can describe their business idea and get analysis about who their likely competitors are. Uh, and they can click on these and um, use the, the competitors, uh, use that link to go to the knowledge graph. And so here I say my new company will build solar panels using recycled soda bottles and offer them to uh, low-income customers. And you can see that it comes up with a set of com uh, other companies that might have similar business models. Uh, and then you could click through and, and learn more about them or see uh, the links there. So this is the, um, that, that was a, the business knowledge graph. So finally, uh, I'm gonna talk about this common sense knowledge graph. So the common sense knowledge graph is work done with um, collaborators on the machine common sense project like Filippo Yevsky, uh, Petr Zekli, and Mayan Kedrival. So in this machine common sense project, um, we've been looking at these common sense questions. So here's an example of a common sense question. On stage, a woman takes a seat at the piano. She, and now you have to pick the right answer. Is it sits on a bench as her sister plays with the doll, smiles with someone as the music plays, is in the crowd watching the dancers, and nervously sets her fingers on the keys. And the reason this um, question is hard is that there are kind of aspects here uh, that make sense uh, with this prompt. So pianos have benches, so sitting on a bench might make sense. Um, you know, pianos play music, so you know we want to understand that that might make sense if there's this overlap. Um, you know, at a piano recital, uh, somebody might be in the crowd, uh, and dancers may be on a, a stage. Uh, and then finally, you know, nervously sets her fingers on the keys. Um, the idea that pianos have keys uh, and are played with fingers is important as well. So these are sorts of places where common sense is important to actually answer the question. Uh, so for a long time, people have been trying to build uh, systems that have this type of common sense. And one instrument that we have in our arsenal is uh, this common sense knowledge graph. So to take this question and understand it, we wanted to look at all of the different resources uh, for common sense knowledge. So for example, uh, there's a common sense knowledge graph called ConceptNet, and ConceptNet uh, captures knowledge about pianos. For example, pianos uh, have keys uh, and they're used for playing music. Uh, and so you can see that music plays and keys both come from ConceptNet. WordNet has uh, information about definition. So for example, that piano is a, a noun uh, and it has information in that definition that can say, you know, for example, it's played by depressing keys uh, and produce sounds. So this might support this idea that pianos are played by pressing keys. Um, the Visual Genome Project tells us um, from looking at visual scenes, co-occurrences uh, of different sorts of objects and artifacts. So a person can play a piano while sitting. Uh, when a person plays the piano, their hands are on the keyboard. So these are sorts of examples of uh, small relationships that you see in visual genome. And then finally, um, models like Atomic give us information about prerequisites and cause effect results. So for example, um, you know, to play a piano, first you need to sit at the piano, uh, you need to be on a stage and you need to reach for the keys. Uh, when you uh, perform on a, a piano, you might feel engaged and competent, but you might, uh, you know, calm, happy, satisfied. So you, you can have a range of feelings from playing the piano. Uh, as you see, uh, nervously is not, here, but you can see that it has a, a, a lot of different feelings that might come from playing the piano. Uh, and then finally, FrameNet captures uh, structured relationships uh, in a particular event or activity. So for example, the audience experiences a performance, uh, the performer entertains the audience, 
and the you know the audience perceives the performance. So these are all things that happen when you attend a performance. So what we'd like to do is put all of these together, uh, and you know Philip Ilyevsky has this um, system or this knowledge graph called the common sense knowledge graph, uh, and this common sense knowledge graph is a way of uh, taking all of these different sources of knowledge and combining them into a single form, uh, into a single package that can be used for these types of different reasoning tasks. So in the common sense knowledge graph, uh, what we have is this uh, unified view, which has information from FrameNet, uh, information from uh, in purple here, uh, information from ConceptNet, uh, that a piano has keys or a piano is used for music and information from things like visual genome. Uh, so that seats are near a piano, a piano's uh, near a person, a keyboard is part of a piano. And these are now interlinked so that all of these knowledge graphs can be um, viewed from a consolidated perspective rather than uh, used piecemeal. So to give an example of how common sense knowledge graphs can be used, I'm going to talk about the work of my student, Pei Zhu. Uh, and one of the things uh, Pei is excited about is looking at communication between humans. And uh, an important part of communication between humans is that a lot of it occurs uh, in, our, in the, the beliefs that we hold in our head. So when we have a conversation, we're actually reasoning and thinking about in our head um, you know, a, a set of ideas. And the only way communication can occur is that is when the ideas in our head and the ideas in our, um, you know, in our partners' heads combine to to reach the same level of uh, understanding. So, you know, when humans have a dialogue or a discussion, um, they make a set of inferences about the concepts and events occurred in that utterance, uh, and then using those inferences, come up with a response. So. Those implicit inferences require common sense background knowledge. And so that background knowledge is really key to how we're able to have discussions and dialogue. Right now, when you look at artificial intelligence approaches to dialogue, many of them are trained end to end. And what this means is that they have um, you know, an utterance and a response, and they try to predict the response without trying to do the implicit reasoning or come up with the, the background knowledge that was used to get to that end goal. So the question is, can these response generation models learn to perform this implicit inference? And so, you know, the human response generation process is to look at the set of utterances that a partner has made, apply common sense to come up with a set of beliefs and inferences, and using those beliefs and inferences, make a response. Uh, and what we'd like is for the response generation model, instead of going directly from the utterance to the response, uh, to actually generate a set of implicit inferences that mirror the sort of common sense knowledge, uh, and then use those implicit inferences along with the dialogue history to make a response. And so here are a few examples of how you can take a, a, a dialogue setting uh, where you know, one person says, I need to buy some flowers for my wife. And using different types of self-talk where, where the response generation model uses common sense to uh, kind of tell itself something implicit, uh, comes up with an implicit fact that might be helpful in this conversation and then generates a response. So in this first uh, example, uh, I need to buy some flowers for my wife. The model thinks, well, buying things requires money. And so, um, you know, the response might be, how much money do you want to spend? And, you know, this might make sense to determine whether you're going to buy really fancy flowers, uh, an expensive arrangement, or something a little more modest. In the second example, the model um, has the same prompt, but it understands that the result of buying something is giving it. And so, you know, the response is, what kind of flowers are you going to give them or are giving them? And the last example is sort of a negative example. So here, the system uh, thinks, well, the opposite of buy is sell. And it says, let's sell some flowers, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so you know, ideally, using these types of implicit self-talk, we can create more informative, more useful, more fluent responses uh, that mirror how a human might respond. 
And so, uh, you know, Pei's results show that if you just train end to end this vanilla response generation, um, the and so uh, in this setting, what we did is we generated a set of pairs, one which uses a self talk setting where some common sense implicit knowledge is generated and used in generating the response. And in the second case, we simply just use an end-to-end -end response generation model. And then we asked mechanical turkers whether they preferred the self-talk response or the response, the vanilla response generation response. Uh, and obviously when we train the self-talk system, not all pairs of um, utterances have some common sense that we can find in, in common sense knowledge graphs. So only about uh, half of the responses had common sense knowledge graph uh, you know, grounding. So we only used half that data. And so the question is, which of these two responses do you prefer? The one that's generated using the self-talk or the one that's using just sort of a normal response generation model? And we asked them three questions. Which response is more informative? Uh, which response is more specific? And which response uh, makes the most sense? And for each of these three questions, they could choose you know, response number one, response number two, or say that they weren't sure. And what we see is that um, the, the respondents strongly prefer the self-talk model. And even when we compare against the ground truth, so what the actual response was in the data set, um, the self-talk model is doing pretty well. You know, these numbers are pretty close. Uh, in some cases, the self-talk model you know, works better for specific and common sense. Uh, and we can see there are cases where people prefer the self-talk model over the ground truth result. And the really interesting thing here is that there's no extra training data, so to speak. There's sort of external knowledge that's coming from the, the, uh, the common sense knowledge graph during the training process. But in the system, we're getting the same utterances and the same, and the same responses when we're training. All we're doing is we're grounding to common sense knowledge to try and create these sort of implicit self-talk uh, phrases. Uh, and so we can look at those self-talk phrases as well and look at whether those sentences make sense, whether they're relevant, and whether they're actually useful for the response. And we can see that uh, three quarters of the time we are getting useful knowledge that's relevant, uh, that, that can be, uh, that makes sense and is used in the response. So to finish up, I'm gonna talk about some tools for knowledge graph construction that uh, different members of the Center on Knowledge Graphs have created. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, as part of the MacroScore project, we've been doing labeling of different types of features of scientific papers, like the, uh, the models used, the subject uh, sample populations, the sample sizes. And so this work um, that Dong Ho and Chang have developed is called Lean Life. And what it allows uh, people to do is provide explanations or, or use explanations to provide those trigger phrases we saw for extraction. So sort of the, you know, the default model for predicting these types of labels on the sentence Paris is the presi president of the University of Southern California assumes Paris is a location. And it makes sense because you know, there, Paris is a very popular uh, location. However, using these trigger phrases uh, where you have this phrase is the president of, you can say actually when you see is the president of, um, the, the subject of that is going to be a person. And so we can use these sorts of um, trigger phrases uh, to learn from users and make a better set of predictions. Um, another set of work that uh, my student Avijit is doing is trying to understand uh, numbers and text because much of the knowledge that we're interested in uh, is quantitative data, which has units. And so to understand these numbers, um, what IVG has been doing is taking sort of the default way that language models process um, sentences and trying to come up with smarter ways of doing that and showing how that works. So there's been a number of uh, different ways that people have thought about uh, you know, tokenizing and representing numbers. So this is sort of the normal, um, you know, uh, BPE encoding in language models that splits uh, tokens. But um, you know, some, some models actually just replace all numbers with a token called num. They don't care what that number is, just that it's a number. Some of them just throw the number out. Uh, some of them use the actual value of the number and you know, encode it in some way. Um, 
there are some that actually take the log of that value, and there's some that look at the um, the exponent in log space uh, of that value. And so, you know, in this case, we're we're doing some encoding and looking up those values. And so, the question is, can we use these different ways of understanding language to a better to do a better job of extracting the knowledge um, for these quantitative data? And so, one of the exciting results is that not only can we um, do better at predicting sort of numerical information, but we can also do better at predicting um, sort of concepts. So these are examples from our forthcoming uh, EMNLP paper where using uh, a, um, a better numerical representation, uh, we can actually do better at these prediction tasks. And these are sentences from Wikipedia. And you can see in the baseline language models, uh, you have sentences like the four petals are about two, and the language model thinks it's meters long, uh, whereas you know a better numerical understanding suggests millimeters because it understands what the, the likely size of petals are, uh, not meters, millimeters. Um, and in this uh, second sentence, it's not actually about the uh, the units, but we're actually looking at uh, the action that a person most likely did. So somebody once blanked along the hard shoulder of M11 at 140 miles per hour to avoid traffic. Uh, and the baseline model predicts walked, uh, which seems uh, unlikely to do at 140 miles per hour, whereas a better you know, numerical representation will understand that you're more likely to be driving at that speed. And then finally, um, you know, the Grimsel Pass is a mountain pass in Switzerland at a blank of 2164 meters. And here, this is a very nuanced question. Is it altitude or elevation? And you know, altitude is generally uh, you know, uh, used to describe locations where elevation is more appropriate for uh, a mountain pass. So here, you can see kind of a more nuanced differentiation between concepts. And so using these sorts of techniques, uh, we're hoping to be able to do a better job of understanding numbers and the different sorts of relationships those numbers have in, in uh, textual data and building better knowledge graph. A third line of work is looking at tabular data. Um, and there's a vast amount of knowledge that's actually stored in tables. Sociopolitical data from governmental organizations like data.gov, the UN, um, the European Commission and the census, the FBI, um, financial and business data uh, from the World Bank, the Federal Reserve, the SEC, uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, uh, and health and environmental data from Medicare or uh, the CDAIC. And so the goal is to take all of this data and extract from it the important knowledge. So uh, my student Keshwan Sun has been working on this problem of capturing that knowledge. And generally that framework looks like three steps. The first is to look at the cell level of tables and try to understand what the value in each cell means. And this is can be pretty hard to do at a cell level. So once we understand those values at a cell level, we can try and find higher level structures, which we call blocks. And blocks are rectangular regions of the table, which have a similar functional purpose uh, throughout the table. So um, you know, a block might be all data or headers or uh, attributes. And then finally, we want to understand the relationships between those blocks. Are they attributes of data? Are they indexes? Are they headers that describe a, a set of values? And so this is the overall flow of table understanding. Looking at this um, a bit deeper, we can look at things at several different levels. So at the cell content level, we can tag them similar to uh, an NER tag. So things like location, numerical values, uh, strings and notes. Uh, going past the cell level, uh, we can go deeper at the block level. And so for blocks, we might look at those cells and try to understand what their functional role is in the table. So this orange block here is metadata telling us that, um, you know, what the title of the table is, maybe uh, the, the fact that it's about Alabama. These headers are describing the values below. So it's providing a, a class of information here. Um, you know, these attributes give us a region number. Uh, so it tells us what area of Alabama we're interested in. And this green region is the main data. 
And then below it, we have some more metadata in the form of nodes. Uh, and then finally, we want to understand the relationships between them. So, you know, this is a header that describes this uh, column of values, while these notes help us understand, uh, you know, based on this A, how something was measured. So it's global information pertinent to this. So, uh, so this is sort of the table understanding framework. Once we understand these tables, there are a number of tools that have been developed sort of downstream uh, to actually take these tables and turn them into uh, knowledge. So, um, you know, work that Avi, uh, Pedro, and I, among others, have worked on is this uh, table linker. And the goal of the table linker is to take a set of entities in uh, a table and map them to a knowledge graph, like Wikidata. So here you can see an example of how these uh, strings are mapped to a set of uh, entities that are all politicians in Colombia. Uh, and then we can map them to a Q node in Wikidata. And so the, the nice thing is that these tools can use uh, fuzzy matching, so they don't need to have exact string match. They can use uh, syntactic features that you know, are specific about how the information is presented, as well as semantic features uh, using embeddings. Uh, and then they can also look at collective information. So the fact that all of these values are in a column together means that they uh, share something in common. That can help disambiguate really, um, really ambiguous entities. Um, a second tool uh, for annotating tables is T2WML. And T2WML is uh, an annotation tool where a user can uh, look at blocks of data like those I showed uh, a couple slides ago and explain what each block does uh, in a very specific way. So for example, here the, uh, the user could say this blue block is a politician, um, this purple block is a, a party, uh, and then this green block is a, a number of votes, and then this purple is a block here is the percentage of votes. And so um, the system can try to help the user automatically determine what the these different regions are, and then the the user can provide the correct Wikidata class or the correct Wikidata model and use that to generate data um, in Wikidata format. The final, to, final tool I'll mention is KGTK. And KGTK is a knowledge graph toolkit. And this is work, uh, again, uh, in the center of knowledge graphs, uh, knowledge graphs that tries to create a, a set of command line tools uh, that can really help uh, people manipulate different knowledge uh, and quickly generate knowledge graphs. So KGTK can import from a lot of popular formats, so um, structured knowledge graphs, relational formats like SQL or Excel or CSV, uh, as well as RDF or um, you know, Neo4j property graphs. It supports transforming the input data, validating it, cleaning it, uh, you know, sorting, filtering, and replacing, performing transformations by uh, doing queries and joins, uh, unions, intersections, and subtractions, so taking that data and connecting it with other data. And then it supports more advanced analytics, such as network, uh, metrics like centrality and page rank and machine learning approaches to provide uh, embeddings and uh, entity linking. Uh, and then finally, the, the end result can comes out in a native KGTK file, but can also be shared with Wikidata, created with Sparkle, uh, imported into uh, elastic search indices, you know, visualized using uh, the embeddings or loaded into, uh, into a property graph. And so, you know, the these tools have helped us across all of those three knowledge graphs um, to very quickly go from raw data into something that's very easy to uh, represent using the standards of knowledge representation, as well as manipulate in different ways to do the types of analysis we've seen. Uh, so to end, um, you know, I, I told you about three knowledge graphs and I motivated them with three really hard problems. Uh, reviewing a paper and understanding not only all of the, the details of that paper, but the scientific context uh, of that paper. Uh, starting a business where you need to understand the competitors uh, for your business, the relevant innovation, patents, et cetera, and understanding uh, you know, how to differentiate your business as well as um, you know, what, what 
what IP you might need to license, what IP you might want to um, patent. And finally, uh, dialogues uh, using AI agents that are fluent, uh, providing these sorts of common sense inferences that make dialogue more natural uh, and more human-like. Uh, and all three of these knowledge graphs are supporting these very difficult knowledge intensive tasks. So the ability to, to do well um, on predicting paper scores, uh, predicting business competitors, and having a response generation model that humans prefer to kind of the ground truth. Those are all uh, great strides made through the use of knowledge graphs uh, that we've built as part of uh, our projects. And so the, the all of this is made possible by this tool chain. And the tool chain is sort of the, the secret sauce that lets us take all of the different types of data that we see across three very different types of knowledge graphs uh, and quickly generate the sorts of uh, knowledge that's useful for these very hard uh, downstream tasks. So uh, with that, I, I'm happy to take questions uh, about you know, the, the knowledge graphs and the tools and the problems we solve using them. Thanks, Jay. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to start with those. Um, the first one is, is computation a bottleneck in knowledge graph? Um, is there research opportunities to work on reducing the computation as well as preserving the model's accuracy? Uh, yeah, let me try to take both of those. And, sorry, I'm trying to see the video again, uh, which is always a tricky problem. Okay, so uh, great. Um, yeah, so computation can be a bottleneck uh, depending on the, the knowledge graph, right? So, um, you know, in the business knowledge graph, one of the interesting problems we have is that there are a million companies so there are potentially a million pairwise scores between all pairs of companies. And the, um, you know, the interesting thing there is that we're able to do a lot of things because of representation learning algorithms, neurosymbolic approaches. And so what you saw in those results for the, um, you know, for the Business Open Knowledge Network here um, is that we're using tools like Doctavec or Roberta to represent uh, knowledge about the entities. And that means that when we make a query, we can do that uh, using algorithms on those learned representations. And we found that to make um, the process much faster. And so one of the interesting research directions is how do you make these sorts of uh, embedded representations of entities work alongside the kind of symbolic representations? And we've had some good results in neurosymbolic models, both for the business knowledge graph and um, the, uh, the macro score knowledge graph for scientific reproducibility. So one way to, uh, to avoid this computational bottleneck is actually to use these neurosymbolic methods um, to, to actually capture some of that knowledge. So I think that, that would be where uh, I think one of the, the biggest research opportunities um, would be. Uh, and then the other thing is that, you know, I think the, the tools that I talked about, like the knowledge graph toolkit, um, and Pedro and Philip and Daniel Garillo are putting together a tutorial on this uh, pretty soon, uh, actually make some of the things that would be impossible to do on a laptop, uh, you know, very easy to do on a laptop. So some of these tools by using a, a lot of optimization and a lot of um, kind of clever approaches, those, uh, those tools are making it possible to do very, very hard things very, very quickly. Thank you. Uh, the second question is, what do you think about the best ways, approaches to augment pre-trained language models with the common sense knowledge from knowledge graphs? Um, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I, I honestly don't know the best answer. Uh, so um, people in our group, uh, notably uh, Philip and company, have worked on lexicalizing the knowledge graphs uh, and basically creating a sentence out of that uh, piece of structured knowledge in the knowledge graph. Uh, and that helps somewhat. Uh, but I think the, you know, the, the final results that are going to work best for these pre-trained language models is some sort of encoding uh, that captures the structured knowledge. And so if you remember um, what Avi was doing, he has these sorts of uh, you know, networks that embed concepts uh, and have lookup embeddings. And so if we can do this uh, at the knowledge graph level, if we can find the right embedding for the knowledge graph and then look up the embedding both at the 
kind of lexical level as well as the symbolic level, uh, I think those sorts of pre-trained models ultimately are going to do better than those that are simply keeping these like lexicalized or DPE kind of split strings, uh, but are actually trying to, where they can, recognize concepts and use them as part of the, the pre-training. Thank you. Uh, is there other, any other questions? I have a couple, so I'll go. Sure. Um, so the first one that I have is about your uh, reproducibility back to mm -hmm. it. Um, models can have very different meaning for different communities. Like is the tool working for like physical models that may not return a p value um, or any like any like cognitive model yeah. like this? That is a, a terrific question. Um, so the project that we're working on is firmly focused on social and behavioral sciences. And in social and behavioral sciences, the world is a lot smaller. Uh, but what we'd like to see, uh, and this is why we're trying to use these sorts of uh, weekly supervised information extraction approaches, is that if somebody were interested in geophysical models, they could find the terminology that applies best to those models. And even in social and behavioral sciences, there's a, a vast uh, disparity between things that are, you know, like psychology papers versus economic papers. Those two communities, even though they're part of the same large umbrella, have very different research approaches. So one question is how much can we even use subdiscipline level features to understand what, uh, you know, a domain expert would find reproducible versus not. But, uh, you know, ideally we would build the tools that would allow any discipline to kind of create the features uh, and we're really focused on social and behavioral sciences currently. Thanks. And uh, my second question also related to science in terms of the common sense knowledge curve. That could be really useful to actually do a first order check of your scientific results. For mm -hmm. example, a river is flowing the right way. How easy would it be to actually give like common sense scientific knowledge into this framework? Yeah, I mean, that seems uh, so you're saying, how do you take a scientific paper and use common sense to check its uh, assertions? I think that's a really hard problem. We're not there yet uh, to, to say, how would you take a paper that, you know, maybe you've written <laughs> about rivers and try to say that the river flows the wrong way? Because often I imagine that there's a lot of very technical language to describe, you know, the way it's flowing north to south, right? And so a common sense system might understand that rivers flow in a certain direction, but there's actually a lot there, right? So if a river flows, you know, north to south, uh, you need to understand the elevation of the different geographical features. And so that, that's a, a lot of interesting. So I think that's a really cool idea, uh, common sense for you know, these types of really uh, scientific questions. And you know, if you're familiar with the work um, that AI2 has done for science exams, I think it does some flavor of that. Uh, but I don't know that the tools that we've developed are really focused on that question. So I, I think it, it's a really cool idea, but we're still working on it. <laughs> the hot question. Any other questions? No, so uh, I'd like to thank Jay for a fantastic talk and we'll resume, uh, I think in a couple of weeks. Thank you everyone. Thanks for having me. <laughs>